I'm Aswad the Modern. I teach at the Stern School of Business at New York University. I've been there since 1986. Um, obviously, our readers are very familiar with you, and, and, and you're legendary in our in our crowds. Let's talk about uh, things you were just talking about in your talk there. Why or when is growth dangerous when you're looking at a, at a company? Growth is always a trade-off. The good side of growth is your earnings become larger over time. The bad side of growth is to get that growth, you've got to put money back into the business. And the net effect is what drives the value of growth. So you can conceivably have a company that has a really high growth rate that's destroying value because to get that growth, it's reinvesting such large amounts of money. Right, so we see that obviously in a lot of new companies, technology companies that have to spend to get the growth. Right. Um, at what point does it become uh, a, a destructor of value? I think it, it's not, in fact, it's a more dangerous game in mature companies because with young growth companies, you cut them some slack because they're still growing, they're going after revenues, it's hope that's driving their growth and you can say, well, hope is good. My problem is with mature companies that keep pushing for growth when the days of growth are behind them. A company like Merck, which has been spending tens of billions of dollars in R&D and has very little to show for it in terms of earnings growth. So I think it's actually a more dangerous game. So I think about companies in terms of where they are in the life cycle. And if you're a company that's maturing or a declining company and you keep pushing for more growth, you're actually destroying value as you're trying to grow. And that's when it becomes really dangerous. Um, let's talk about the real drivers of value. Mm -hmm. You have a, a, a way of looking mm -hmm. at this in, in, uh, in a spreadsheet, but there are four, I believe. Or what, yeah. are, what are the four you look at? The, the four questions you always have to ask when you look at a company is, what are your cash flows from your existing investments? You've already been on the ground for a while. What are you doing with all those assets? The second is, what's the value of growth? The third is, how risky are you as a company? And the final question is, when will you become a mature business? Because I need to tie up some loose ends. Unless I answer those four questions, I really cannot value a company. You mentioned your study of the 42,000 plus public companies mm -hmm. um, and their growth projections. Mm -hmm. As you did the, the calculations, tell us what you were looking at and what did you discover? It's not so much about growth projections as much about the trade-off and whether it was working in their favor. And a very simple metric of whether you're creating value by investing is to look at what you earn as a return on your invested capital versus what it costs you to raise capital, the cost of capital. So if you have a return on capital that exceeds your cost of capital, you're creating value. If it's equal, you're kind of running in place. And if it's less, you're destroying value. Two thirds of the 42,000 companies that I looked at are earning returns on capital less than the cost of capital. Some had a very good reasons. It might have been a bad year, but that's not a good sign. That tells you that a lot of growth around the world is more value destruction than value creation. Yet when we look at the way a lot of I don't want to say Wall Street, but the way the banks and, and people value companies and they're looking at earnings projections and growth. We're in a cycle right now where that's right. happening. Um, the, there is optimism in general among investors, but is it, is it wrong footed? I think in many cases you've got to be careful about growth. Growth by itself is the starting point for your analysis. It cannot be the ending point. So I'm not saying you should not look at growth, but you should look under the growth and ask, is it good growth or bad growth? Um, when you look at a company like Uber, and you've been looking at valuation for Uber, its valuation privately is north of 40 billion. Seven, 70 billion. Now. 70 billion. Yeah. What is it that people don't understand about the way that company is growing or makes money that, that you've been looking at? I think Uber has found the magic to growth in terms of revenues. If you look at how quickly it's growing, it's found a way to grow incredibly fast. What it hasn't cracked the code to is how to make money off those revenues. And the problem with Uber is their business model right now is not sustainable. It's a business model that will allow them to grow fast, but will not allow them to make money. It put itself in, the, in, in, a, in a weird economic spot, putting the customer at the center of right. the experience. And now it's expanding that. Is, is, there a, is, is it that they can't find a way to make real money off that? What's the problem? I think the basic problem is they've created a business with no competitive advantages. A business where scaling up is easy to do because that's what worked for them. They wanted to scale up quickly, which meant they didn't buy the cars, didn't hire the drivers. It created this really low capital intensity model that allowed them to go from nothing to what they are in almost no time at all. But those are exactly the things that are acting as a weakness for them because it allows others to get into the market exactly the way they did and start eating away at their margins, their profits. So they're having a tough time figuring out how to convert the revenues into profits because they built a business model that is not a model that's easily profitable. Let's talk about some of the social media companies and valuing mm -hmm. them you just mentioned. The problems with valuing social media companies by the amount of users they have. Yeah. Now, 
if what's the problem with that and if there is what how should we be valuing as with as with growth you can start with users as your starting point so how many users obviously the more users you have the greater the base you can build off but then you could ask yourself the question how do i make money off those users and that's what separates the facebooks from the twitters of the world facebook has users it's figured out a way to make money off those users by keeping them engaged selling them ads and other stuff while they're engaged Twitter has users, but those users are not engaged. And because they're not engaged, Twitter can't sell them stuff. There's no advertising. So I think the user base is a good place to start, but again, you've got to ask those follow-up questions to decide, is this a valuable company? Right, and when you look at Twitter, um, and, when, and the projections for, uh, it bounces around a lot, where do you land on value? I think right now Actually, it's per- The question is, where do you land on value, and where do you land on price? Mm-hmm. I think right now it's pretty close to fairly valued. I think at about 13. It went at 75. It looked hopelessly overpriced to me. I think at about 13 or 14, it reflects the lowered expectations, the lowered ambitions for the company. People don't think it's going to become a star company anymore. They're just hoping it starts to make money. So you can see how expectations have been ramped down at the company as it's matured as a company. It's been unable to convert those users into revenues and profits. Okay, two more questions. Mm-hmm. I'll let you go. Uh, we're obviously known for our addiction area, although we've grown mm-hmm. in a bunch of different ways since then. We, al- we like to ask people like you, what's your favorite financial term or definition? Why? How do you, how do you look at it and use it in your practice and your teaching and, and in your investing? My favorite term is value because value to me carries with it all the weights of forcing you to think about understanding a business, telling a story, converting the, that story into numbers. So to me, value doesn't come from a spreadsheet. It's not the present value of cash flows. It's something much more important. And until we understand and recognize what value is, we'll start, you know, we, 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 as investors, we'll always have trouble investing based on that value. What is the biggest mistake that investors make when looking at value? The biggest mistake they make is they mistake price for value. And they can't decide which is which. So they use the two words interchangeably. If you ask them what's the value of something, they often tell you what the price of it is. And I think we need to separate the two terms and talk about them very differently. Your biggest influence professionally, uh, how have they impacted your life, and how do you use what they taught you and what you do today? My biggest influence is Gene Farmer because I used to be his, um, I was his uh, research assistant in 1980, 1981, 1982 when he came to UCL and I was a PhD student there because I was impressed by how philosophically coherent his thoughts were. I mean, he, you might not agree with him, but you can never accuse him of being two-faced. He's been very clear about what he thinks. I don't believe in efficient markets the way he does, but he's laid the foundation for how I think about markets. And the way I describe it is I think markets make mistakes, but I always respect markets and treat, I mean, you have to treat markets with respect. You can't view markets as being stupid or less worthy of your attention for whatever reason. Last one best book you've read recently or, or in your career that you think is most influential for um, students and people who follow you and, and people who want to become investors? Or this is an uncommon example, M- Michael Lewis's Moneyball, because to me it's about using numbers sensibly. And we live in a, an age of big data where we don't seem to be using that big data very well in investing. Great. We really appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you.